Shalom, shalom, wonderful friends. Thank you for joining us. I know others are trickling in and many of you are here with us on the live stream. And we are so excited to be learning uh, with you today and with our scholar, Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz, um, on a range of important, crucial, timely issues. Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz is co-founder and president of Maharat, the first institution to ordain Orthodox women as clergy, also serves on the rabbinic staff at the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale. Rabbi Hurwitz completed Drisha's three-year scholars circle program an advanced intensive program of study for Jewish women training to become scholars, educators, and community leaders. After another five years of study under the auspices of Rabbi Avi Weiss, she was ordained by Rabbi Weiss and Rabbi Daniel Schwerber in 2009. In 2013, Rabbi Hurwitz was awarded the Hadassah Foundation Bernice S. Tenenbaum Prize and the Myrtle Wreath Award from the Southern New Jersey region of Hadassah in 2014. 2016, she was a Trailblazer Award recipient, UJA Federation of New York. She was named as one of the forward 50 most influential Jewish leaders and Newsweek, Newsweek's 50 most influential rabbis. In 2017, Rabbi Hurwitz was chosen to be a member of the inaugural class of the Wexner Foundation Field Fellows. She received the Rabbi Israel Libby uh, Mashuetz Award by the New York Board of Rabbis in 2023. Mazel tov. She and her husband, Josh Abraham, are parents to Yona, Zacharia, Davidi, and Natan. Uh, Rabbi Sarah, you've been a, a friend uh, and partner of ours at Uri Tzedek for a long time. And as always, we are grateful to learn with you. And friends, this, the source sheet, which uh, will be on the screen, is also just shared in, in the chat if you want to access it there as well. And if you're on the live stream, the, uh, it'll be shared in the comments of the live stream as well. Rabbi Sarah, welcome. Thank you, uh, Rosh Mili. It's always a pleasure to see you and be here with you. Such a a fan and um, been a pleasure to to watch Uri Tzedek. Um, evolve and grow over these years. So thank you for hosting me again. Um, I have had two topics on my mind, like everybody, I imagine, and wanted to share some, some thoughts, um, both about what's happening in Israel and what's happening here um, with respect to anti-Semitism. As, as was said, timely, timely topics and it's also hard to talk about anything else these days. And I imagine that there's uh, a lot of Torah and and Shirim that are being shared um, tend to gravitate towards making sense of the world that we're finding ourselves in right now. I uh, uh, will just begin by sharing that since October 7th, like many of us, those first few days were filled with shock and and um that has continued and a disbelief that for, at, for me at least sent me into a, just a complete state of being frozen right i there were, i didn't know what to do what to think what to say and as a rabbinic leader i felt like a pressure to uh, to be able to share my deep thoughts or or at least for my students at Yeshiva Maharat, sort of be a figure of leadership and authority. Um, and it really took until almost two weeks, so it was a week and a half later, for me to sort of wake up and realize what was necessary. And what what I realized I needed to do was just to go and be there. Um, now, five, you know, almost six months into the war, many people, if have had the uh, the uh, um, ability to go and so uh, you know getting up and going doesn't seem like such a profound thing but i think a week and a half or two weeks after after that uh that first moment um it was all so new and uh you know it was a time where the planes were totally empty the airport was empty when i showed up at at newark airport to the ll terminal there was still um, the sweet table of people there um, playing musical instruments and singing Am Yisrael Chai and offering snacks because most of the people who were traveling were Chai Lim or, or citizens trying to get back home. Um, and of course, uh, the the many, 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 many duffels, um, bags of supplies that were being shipped over and out to, to Israel. Um, and one of the reasons why I realized that I wanted to go is because I I needed to 
um, both see for myself and feel for myself what was going on. But more than that, it was sort of a personal mission. <laughs> We're all going on missions now. It was a personal mission to uh, uh, put my eyes on my students. We have 25 alumni and students in in uh, um, Maharat that have either graduated and are, are working there or have lived there and are current students. And many of the students there um, have either either had husbands who were called up immediately to the front line, either north or south, or um, had children who were called up immediately. Um, and just in general, their lives in particular had been had been thrown. And so what I did is I I went and um, sat with all I I basically traveled around the country and sat with them and just listened and heard their pain and their stories. Um, it turned out to be a very feminine trip um, because it was it was being welcomed into uh, into homes, sitting at kitchen tables, sitting, you know, get, I I bought chocolates because that's all I could bring, and they sort of returned um, the favor with lunch or cookies or coffee. Um, and and there was just a lot of crying and and thinking like what are we gonna do how are we gonna keep living our lives um, because nothing feels normal. And then I went a second and a third time and by though by by the second and third time um, I led a mission with Jofa and Maharat um, we took thirty five people both again students alumni and um, lay leaders and uh, at this time. Um, the, the conversation in Israel was still only one conversation, but the, the, uh, the, the there was a little bit more organization. Um, and one question that was that was uh, being had was, what is our obligation to go down south and to see and bear witness um, what it means to to be a uh, to be a war tourist? Like is is war tourism something that is positive or negative? And it was a a a question that I was asking myself. It was a question about whether um, I, it was curiosity that I I, I needed to to uh, to go down to Kfar Aza and see what was there, or was there something sort of deeper? Um, and again, like why was it that I got onto a plane and went to go visit my students? Like, you know, it's a very Rabbi Weiss. I'm a student of Rabbi Weiss. It's a very Rabbi Weiss thing to do, just show up. Um, but I started thinking more deeply about what it meant to to bear witness. So I just want to start there um, to frame our conversation. Um, what is what is interesting about um, bearing witness and what I started thinking about is is it is probably our deepest one of our deepest obligation as as Jews because bearing witness isn't just seeing it's not just being a witness in terms of opening our our eyes and looking at something bearing witness um bears responsibility and 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 obligation for the person who is witnessing and my thinking here actually comes from from the Shema right when you the Shema Israel Hashem Lekeinu Hashem Echad um is is uh, when it's written in the Torah, the ayin and the dalid are are written um, larger, right? So I can just share a screen for a second for those who, because you don't have this, but I'll, I'll just you know show you the obvious. The ayin and the dalid are written larger in the parchment of a sefer Torah, and of course, when you pull those words out, the uh, they they spell aid. And I started reflecting on the idea that when you in the tefillah where you cover your eyes and you surround yourself by darkness and you put your head down even as I do and you're supposed to be focusing on like the most I don't know religious and godly matters that's the tefillah where we're asked to actually open our eyes and to look up and out and beyond ourselves and to be an aid to be a witness so what does it mean to be a witness how does one witness now we could go through all of the halakhot of of edut and talk about how you know witnessing is a communal obligation it requires more than one person to to see something and and uh, there's a, a a back and forth engagement with the sanhedrin and we could go into all of that but i think that the the end of the day what what the halakhic language bears out for us is that Bearing witness is a, is ultimately about action and about activism, right? We we bear witness so that we can remember, 
um, and we can we can see something and then remember and then tell it over to a future generation or tell it over to others or tell it over um, so that we are are carving into memory something that that we have witnessed and it needs to be remembered for generations so that we can learn from what we've seen. Um, and I think it also requires us to it requires us to to transform that seeing into action to not only just look but to decide how it's changed us to allow the the witnessing to um, be an embodied experience so to speak and to to recognize what we need to do differently after seeing seeing what has been seen um, it's actually something that that has been borrowed from this sort of age old conversation that's been going on for many years about these trips to Poland or trips to Germany. My my son um, is studying. I have twin boys who are studying in Israel for the year and um, in different yeshivot. And one of them right now is uh, literally in Poland right now. He's I, possibly even in Majdanek right now. He uh, the yeshiva takes them um, takes takes the kids for those who would like to 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 go and bear witness and. Uh, the the question has always been asked there. Why do we need to expose young young people to the uh, to the terrible scenes um, and and you know the piles of shoes and the piles of hair? Like, what are they gaining from from seeing that? Um, and in this case, what are they gaining from also seeing the the yeshivot in Lublin and the the graves the gravestones? Although he's a Kohen, so he's sort of missing out on the what does Jewish life look like um, before the war, which is where those conversations are, have, are happening. But both those conversations, both looking at, at, uh, at life before the Shoah, as well as the impact and the effect of the Shoah is, is really becoming more and more essential and crucial as we move further away from the, the Shoah in terms of, of our history. Um, and I think that here too, the the obligation to show up and to to bear witness is is a way that I've been um, thinking about like my desire and need to go and sort of my encouraging my students and alumni to to as as much as possible um, to go and be part of what's happening. So that's that's how I think about um, you know this notion of of um, the role that diaspora jury is playing vis-a-vis um, -vis supporting supporting Israel. And that it's not only about going and seeing, it's also about the many other ways we can support um, support our, our larger community. And um, this conversation really brings to mind uh, the book that Dara Ho Tara Horn wrote, um, that Jews love ten people. I, I I sat on a panel with Dara, so I you know obviously I'm sure many of us have read the book, but the she makes the the argument that um, that there's a fascination um, with with the ways in which the Jewish community has always been. Um, impacted and and uh people like the, the how the the rise of anti-semitism throughout the ages has uh impacted Jewish communities around the world for for many many years um and that there's a general fascination with not only dead Jews with Jews in general and I think the point of a book is like what might it be like to focus on on um the uh, the positive aspects of Judaism or the way in life is 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 lived um and the way that you sort of embrace a living Judaism and not only focusing on the past but I think there's also a recognition that we have to understand the past and understand the past in order to inform our future and that's that's my bridge that I want to I want to move forward with right now which is is building on on um you know, this idea that we're so focused and I'm so focused right now on this tragic, the tragic events and and the ways in which dead Jews are like impacting. You know, I'm I'm quoting her. It's a terrible phrase, but is is impacting me and 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 so many of uh, around us on a daily basis. Um, what can we learn about what's happening here in America? Um, and um many of you may have seen an article that Dara Horn wrote in The Atlantic a few a few weeks ago, it, well, actually, it's 
already a month ago um, in February. And I'm not going to go through the specifics, but the um, uh, I am going to now open up our new source sheet, which I think you you now have access to. But but I encourage everybody just as a start starting point to to read the article to get access to it. I've pulled out some pieces that I think are are interesting and relevant. But but really, what what the picture she paints is that anti-Semitism has been around for a very long time. What we're seeing now isn't that new, and I think is also um, it, it, the 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 tropes with which people are sort of criticizing um, not only Jews but but the the enterprise of Zionism is just a con a, a, fro a cover a front for for um, for something else that's deeper. So what I wanted to to spend a few minutes with you with with all of you on now, especially because we're moving towards the holiday of Purim, which is, I think, where anti-Semitism begins. And I'm going to make that argument with you in a minute. I want us to be really clear on trying to come up with a definition of anti-Semitism. You know, so if if we were if this was a, a back and forth class, I might ask you and and you know feel free to put it in the in the chat. Like if you had to define anti-Semitism um, for us right now, if you had to define what anti-Semitism means, what would your definition be? How would you define um, define it? Now you might be wondering, well, it's so obvious, meaning <laughs> there isn't a it's not rocket science. Um, but I actually think that that trying to come up with a definition will help us understand how to confront it. So, you know, if you if you if you would like, you know, throw into the chat, I don't even know if the chat's open, um, your thoughts or definitions of anti-Semitism, um, which I think will, or at least in your own mind, like start developing what you think a a um a reasonable definition is. And as you do that, I want to ask the question of where where did anti-Semitism start? Um, I want to just make an aside, by the way, about spelling. Um, the the spelling for anti-Semitism is actually without the dash. I see here that I did not correct it throughout the source sheet. I will go back and correct it afterwards. But um, actually, the the new def the new way to, meaning that both spellings used to be um, acceptable, but it seems now that the acceptable way to spell anti-Semitism is without the dash. So I will, I, I'm just saying that as an aside and I will go back and correct it. Um, all right, so the question is, it was the first, as you're thinking about the definition of anti-Semitism, the question is, was the first definition of anti-Semitism um, or the first moment of anti-Semitism as early as as the beginning of Shmot, the beginning of Exodus, right? We know the story, Vayakam Melech Hadash, um, it's Ryan, there was a new king, Lo Yadai Yosef, who no longer knew Yosef, no longer understood him, he evolved, it was a new person, right? We don't need to get into that right now. But um, he looks out at what's happening in, in Mitzrayim and he says, look, um, there's a, a a people hine am bene israel um that are rov atsumimeni that are mimenu that are are more numerous than us um let us deal with them shrewdly so that they don't increase um and that they don't rise up and and fight us so uh, if we are developing a definition of anti-semitism we might want to ask it, is that this right this seems to be a generalized um hate towards a group of people with rational reason, right? That there is a group of people who, if we don't do something about them, they are going to continue to to um, populate Mitzrayim and, 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 and promulgate, and, and we need to figure out how to reduce their numbers and sizes. Otherwise, they're going to basically subsume the people of Egypt. So anti-Semitism or not, I don't know. Let's let's hold it. But it seems certainly that there is is hate, um, and it seems to be some kind of like rational reasoning. The next um, model that I wanted to bring um, to us to look at is is from Devarim. We are going to be reading this um, not this Shabbat but next Shabbat, the Psukim about Amalek. And here too, what you may or may not have noticed is, is while this seems like um, total 
um, unadulterated hate. I have a question about whether there's a reason behind the hate or not. So what do we know? We have to remember Zachor et et Asher Asalecha Amalek Baderech, um, what they did to us when we were coming out of Mitzrayim, that they attacked us from the back, that they they didn't fear God, that they attacked those who were weak and weary. And um, because of this, we should blot out Amalek and do not forget, right? So I don't want to get in right now to the, I don't know, the morality of Amalek. There's a lot to talk about and think about, but but I, I wanted to notice that there's actually no reason given here. So I went back to Shmot just to double check. And there too, when we're introduced to uh, to Amalek for the first time, there really isn't any anything um, specifically that is, is um, noted in terms of the reason why Amalek attacked us. So basically just said that Amalek, they came and they fought. And then the rest of the Pesukim delve into how Moshe and um, how um, Yoshua and Kalev sort of supported Moshe's hands in order to overwhelm Amalek and to ultimately uh, win that battle. So here we have the story of Shmot, the story of, of Amalek. What we see in Shmot is Paro giving a reason for wanting to destroy the Jews. And in the story of Amalek, um, there is no rational reason given. So two models of hate, one rational and one irrational. So if we're going to ask the question again, are these both examples of anti-Semitism or are they... Um, or are, is one like more considered under the category versus the other? So I want to share here several thoughts by Rabbi um, Lord Jonathan Sachs. And the reason why I have picked him as sort of the voice here is um, I think actually Rabbi Sachs um, had a, a lot to say because this was a topic he had to deal with so often, right? As a leader in you in the UK, but also as somebody who had to be in position of creating bridges between other faith communities and the monarchy in general. Um, he, I think, had to be very aware of the lines and the par parameters of what of what um, anti-Semitism meant and how he was sort of supporting his communities. And so he actually wrote prolifically, prolifically about, about anti-Semitism. And I wanted to share um, a few of, of his thoughts. So on this particular topic, he makes the argument, you can agree or disagree, I would be curious to hear whether you do, whether there's a difference actually between anti-Semitism and xenophobia. So he he says that the paradigm of anti-Semitism is actually irrational hate, right? So um, it would be the Am Amalek model. Um, there is no reason given. In the Middle Ages, Jews were accused of poisoning wells, spreading the plague, and in one of the most absurd claims ever, the blood libel. They were suspected of killing Christian children to use their blood to make matzot for Pesach. This was self-evidently impossible, but that did not stop people believing it. Anti-Semitism was the supreme irrationality of the age of reason. So whatever the reason of the time um, that gave a reason for a power to hate the Jews, they sort of lashed onto that irrational reason. It's irrational because it wasn't real. It didn't happen. As opposed to what he says, and you know, you would go back and look at the full article, but what he says is, is that the uh, um, model of Paro in, in Egypt, he claims is xenophobia because it is true that the Jewish people were literally, um, were, 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 having many children and and there was really a concern that they would form an army rise up and eradicate the Egyptians and so that was more about fear of a whole population versus versus actual irrational hate um and just to to go a little bit deeper you know this idea of irrationality is is of irrational hate is the flip of uh, of this this commonly quoted um, Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, where where there are two kinds of love: love that de that is that depends on something, and love that does not. So if it if it's taluya, if it depends on a taluya if it depends on something, if that thing disappears, then so does the love. 
right? So if it's if it if there is a a love that is is based on something and that thing is no longer there, then then so so the love disappears. You could say the flip about hate, right? You could take it to its its natural conclusion about hate, which is that if if hate is based on a specific thing and that thing is removed, so then the hate disappears. But if the hate is irrational or you know unconditional, or if the love is unconditional, meaning it is it's not dependent on anything, um, it will always be there. So too, hate will always be there if if it's it's not necessarily dependent on anything. Okay, so that's sort of laying out the foundation for for um, coming up with some definitions of 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 hate and anti-Semitism. Um, but now I want to sort of push it forward a little bit to say maybe there's irrational or rational distinctions, but perhaps at the core of anti-Semitism it is just like hatred for that which is different. Um, and, and that's really the the definition that I want to build upon now and see if that resonates. And, and again, if it does, therefore, what do we do about it, which is really the, the place that I, I wanted to go. Um, so there are those who say that the uh, hate that um, and that was uh, occurred between Haman and Mordechai is the most explicit um, form of anti-Semitism. Um, so let's look at it in let's look at it inside so I can build that case. We're familiar with the story, right? Um, Actually, I just want to go a little bit further down for those who are following along. Let's just remind ourselves of what happened right before this in the beginning of chapter three. Um, after, you know, after the first two chapters where we're setting the scene and the stage for who Akash Beirush is and for the whole, um, the, the remarriage to Esther and that whole uh, situation where Esther finally um moves into the into the palace so after all these things beginning of chapter three uh Ahashverosh promoted Haman he's the son of Hamidata Agagi um and he and Haman now has a lot of power and then it says we call of day Hamelech Asher Bashar Hamelech Korim Meshachavim Lahaman and all of the uh, the people at the palace gates, the king's courtiers, whoever was around, seemed very happy to bow down to Haman, right? Haman needed to be bowed to. Everybody was happy to do that. But there was one person who would not comply, and that was Mordechai. And then, Vayar Haman ki ein Mordechai korea mishtachave lo v'yamale Haman chema that when Haman saw that Mordechai would not kneel or bow low to him, Haman was filled with rage. Now, he could have been filled with rage and taken it out on one person. But instead, now we can go back to where we were before in um, source number seven. Um, what happens is, is this hate, um, irrational hate really, subsumes him so much that he wants to take it out on an entire group of people rather than focusing it and locating it on the person who he feels that he was wrong by, he uh, assumes that it's it's a problem with an entire group of people. And so he goes to Achashverosh and, uh, and makes the case and the argument for how there's this group of people out there who uh, um, in all of the Medinat of the, the Malchut, who, uh, um, who whose laws are are different um and they uh, are they don't obey the king's laws and it's not in your it's im al hamelach tov yikatev la la abdim ba aseret alafim kikar kesa right like it's not in your majesty's interest to tolerate them if it please the majesty if it pleases your majesty let there be an edict drawn and let me pay thousands of silver to to deposit in the in the, the the royal treasury, and therefore the king moved his removed his ring and basically gave Haman the authority and the power 
to impose restrictions and ultimate death to the Jewish people. So I want to look more closely at his arguments. Um, we're going to break them down a little bit and to ask the question of, are these arguments more like, you know, Paro? Are they more like Amalek? And and what is unique about these these arguments, right? So just to um, to highlight the obvious, there's a certain people, they're scattered and they're dispersed. Um, their laws are different from the other people and they do not obey the king's laws, right? Those are, are uh, Haman's well-thought-out, structured, strategic argument. So in comes the Gemara. Um, we're going to look at the Gemara and Atargam Sheini a little bit slightly later. Um, the Gemara, um, like it does, wants to imagine the conversation uh, between Haman and Ahasuerus and to, to give it a little bit more detail. So what is actually happening between Haman and Ahasuerus? Now, I, I always state it that way because I want people to sort of imagine the scene that the rabbis are laying out. And and why are the the rabbis, why is Chazal in the time of the Gemara, why, why are the Chachamim imagining the details of this conversation? In other words, what's happening for them around the writing of the Gemara that is influencing them to imagine this kind of this kind of dialogue between between Haman and, and Achashverosh? Okay, so um so um, there are the sages among them who observe the mitzvah. And Haman said to them, they are, the, they are, okay, let's go back. He said to Achash, let us destroy them. Achash said to him, I'm afraid of their God, right? He first, his first argument is, I know from, from my history that if we destroy the Jewish people or, or take up arms against them, then God is going to come and, um, going to fight them. And so that's the first argument. And, um, Haman says, you know, don't worry about them. Because Amarle Yashno, Yashnu Minha Mitzvah, they've been asleep at the wheel. <laughs> These people are scattered all over the world. They're not a cohesive community, and they're actually not so Shomri Mitzvah. They're not abiding by Jewish law, and therefore God wants nothing to do with them. So Amarle it behu Rabbanan, Amarle Amechad Hain. Um, Achashvari said to the sages among them, who observe the mitzvah, Haman said to him, there are, there are people that, that don't observe and their laws are so diverse from, from those of, of every people, they do, like they do not eat from, so, so first he says they don't observe the mitzvah and then in this, again, irrational way, he switches tactics and says, and actually the attempts are not kolam, their, their, their laws and their ways are so different. What does it mean that they're so different? Delo achli minan, velo nasvi. Minan, velo minas vilan, right? They, they, um, they don't eat from our food, nor they do, do they marry our women, nor do they marry off to us, nor do they keep the king's laws, right? So now this is a third argument. They don't keep our laws, um, so they they keep their own. They, they're not from, but they don't eat our food and marry our women, and they don't keep your laws. What does this mean? Um, they spend the entire year in idleness and constantly saying. Shehi pehi, an acronym for for you know waiting when when um trying to figure out when the chagim are when Shabbat is, therefore it does not profit the king to tolerate them as they eat and drink and scorn the throne, and a proof of this is that even if a fly falls in the cup of one of them, he will throw the fly out and drink the wine it fell into. But if my master the king were to touch the glass uh, of one of them, he would throw it to the ground and would not drink it. Okay, so. Haman is is finding the tropes and the tactics of the time to uh, underscore that the Jewish people are ultimately different. They're 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 different because they keep mitzvot. They're different because they don't keep mitzvot. They're different because um, and, and ultimately, therefore, they hate the they they hate um, Achashverosh and hate the king, and therefore the king should hate them. I think the argument is even stronger. It, uh, in the Targum Sheni, which is a, a book of Midrash from the 8th or 9th century. And so here, too, it's really just a list of the ways in which Haman is painting a picture of who the Jews are. I'm just going to read it quickly in English. Um, and I'm sort of reading it this way on purpose, because what I, I want to show is, is like, how familiar are these statements? They've been around as accusations of, of, 
our people for years and years. So whenever they, the Jews, see us Gentiles, they spit on the ground. They think of us as something disgusting. We don't marry the daughters and they don't marry ours. If it's a day that they want to buy something from us, they say today it's permitted day. But when they want to buy something from them, they say today it is forbidden and the market is closed. And to their menstruants, after seven days, they go into the middle of the night and they pollute water. On the eighth day, they cut off their son's foreskins and have no mercy in them. They say that they want to be different from us. Every seventh day, they observe the Shabbat. They go to their synagogues, read the books, translate their prophets, and curse our kings. On the 15th of Tishrei, they pray and rejoice, and they go into circles saying Hoshana, and they jump and dance like goats. And we don't know whether they're cursing us or blessing us. Whenever they sell to us, they cheat us, and they do not give us full price when they buy. It seems like no matter whether whether we're completely integrated or part of the community, not part of the community, there's always going to be an inherent suspicion of, of the Jewish people. And I think what what I'm, I I want to um, convey is that this different is difference is irrational, and basically the, at the core of it is just an irrational hatred of of what's different, right? So this is what Jonathan Sachs says again, Rabbi Sachs says again, if we want to go back and understand anti-Semitism, the answer lies with the verse with which I began, right? This is from, from um, Al-Pasuk, Yishna Amechad, Mufuzar, um, Umufurad, Ben Ha'amim. This is, a, there's a certain people who are different from everyone else. This is why Jews are hated, because we are different. Anti-Semitism is the paradigm case of dislike of the unlike. And you will say, but everyone's different. Every nation is different. And it's true. Every nation is different. But only Jews throughout history consistently insisted on the right to be different and the duty to be different and the dignity of difference. They were the only people over the long haul of history who refused to assimilate to the dominant culture or convert to the dominant faith. This um, idea of difference was picked up by Erica Brown. It was picked up by, by Michael Fox, right? You have these sources. You can look at them uh, yourself. And also was picked up by Theodor Herzl himself, right? In the solution to the Jewish question, he asks, he asks the question that I think many people ask. And it's actually a question that's asked of, of Mordechai, right? Let me just phrase the question and then we'll, we'll embed it into what Herzl is trying to say, which is that, like, what if Mordechai had just bowed down? You know, if he had just acquiesced and if he had just like taken one for the team then perhaps the whole story of Purim would have been prevented perhaps you know he he needed to have done something that was difficult and went against his like core belief system in order to save the Jewish people from harm um, if he had just integrated if he had just completely assimilated if he had just gone along with what everybody expected of him then Nobody would hate the Jewish people. And I think that what, what Theodor Herzl says, not about Mordechai, but I think the same sentiment is that that's just not true. Like there would be, if if Mordechai bowed down to Haman that time, there would have been another excuse or reason for Haman to hate Mordechai at a later time. We would have found a different um, trope or a different reason to impose onto a group of people merely because they're, they're embracing throughout um, throughout time difference. So, you know, I'm just going to skip to the last few lines. In our native lands, where we have lived for centuries, we are still decide we are still decried as strangers, often by men whose ancestors had not yet come at a time when Jewish size had long been heard in the country. If we were left in peace, if only, if only we were just left in peace. But I think we shall not be left in peace. Right? There's no. There's nothing we can say or do or no way we can integrate fully into our current society um, that will keep us safe and protected. Um, so therefore, what do we do, <laughs> right? What is the, if, if hate is, if anti-Semitism at the core of it is irrational hate and and um, that hate is going to happen no matter what. How do we confront it? Um, so Rabbi Sachs tells the story. Let me just um, go to source number 16. I'll come back to 15 in a minute. Uh, he tells the story of, of um, the time in the 90s uh, when, when the Soviet the Soviet jury was was freed and uh, was allowed to to 
finally um, embrace their Judaism and practice freely. But what that also meant is that there was also an uptick of, of anti-Semitic attitudes that had also been suppressed for many, many years, and they surfaced. And it was also a time where Jews from around the world sort of poured into, uh, into the Soviet Union to try to re-educate and bring more Jewish Judaism to uh, uh, Jewish people who, again, their, their ideas of Judaism had been suppressed for so long. And, um, and so he tells a story about how a British rabbi had gone there to help with the reconstruction of Jewish life and was one day visited by a young lady in distress. All my life, she said, I hid the fact that I was a Jew and no one ever commented on my Jewishness. Now though, when I walk past my neighbors, they mutter, Jew, what shall I do? The rabbi replied, if you had not told me you were Jewish, I would have never known. But when with my hat and my beard, no one could miss the fact that I'm a Jew. Yet in all the months I've been there, no one has shouted Jew at me. Why do we think that is? The girl was silent for a moment and said, because they know that if they shout Jew at me, I will not take it as an insult. I will take it as an insult. If they shout Jew at me, I will take it as an insult. But if they shout Jew at you, you will take it as a compliment. This is a deep insight. Beyond eternal vigilance, the best way for Jews to combat anti-Semitism is to wear their identity with pride. So I've been thinking a lot about this, right? If we can, if, if the premise, I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second. If we can, if the premise is that we should um, understand the core of anti-Semitism in order to know how to, how to deal with it in this current environment, it seems to me that what Rabbi Sachs is suggesting is that the antidote is knowing that hatred is irrational and therefore, the only thing to do is to embrace our Judaism even more, is to, is to uh, you know, proudly sort of walk around with a kippah on if that is something you do, or proudly sort of have, um, you know, proudly celebrate the holidays um, and sort of have a, a if they're going to hate irrationally our differences, then we should embrace um, our differences. Because I think the alternative is not is not realistic, right? So let me just paint a picture for what the um, alternative might look like. Um, I've been thinking about this because I saw a newspaper article, maybe it was not this past Shabbos, the Shabbos before, or last weekend, I saw a front page article in New York Times about my alma mater, about um about barnard and uh, there's a uh, um a movement towards erasing or or no longer allowing students to decorate their doors why can't they decorate their doors because it would eliminate um it would eliminate the ability of jew of, of anybody not jews of people to put up anti-semitic sentiments on their doors right so what was happening is that there was a lot of you know, um, Jews are are performing genocide from um, from the C to C. You know, all of these these tropes that we've been hearing, and so the thinking by the administration was that if rather than uh, asking those hatred forms of speech to be taken off doors, their thinking was that if we could just like scrub all the doors clean and no longer allow anybody, any student to uh, decorate their doors in any way or put any signage on their doors, then that's a way of solving a problem. So I started thinking about it. Um, I started reflecting back <laughs> 100 years ago of the ways in which um, us college students would decorate our doors. And um, and she too, the author of this article was reflecting on on like the whiteboards that people would put on their on their doors to say like you know I came to visit you weren't here or meet me in the cafeteria or I'm at the library come find me um or you know happy birthday signs or welcome back or like the ways in which people use their their spaces their own individual spaces to to um 
be emblematic of who they are and to decorate, like find their own creativity and, and express it in an external way. And how for many, many years, that's been a positive thing. Now, obviously what we're seeing now is that those forms of expression are turning into, are turning into um, incitement and are turning into derogatory and certainly anti-Semitic um, statements. Um, but I wonder what if, what if the the tactic by the administration had been not to eradicate difference um, and not to like make every door the same and to not and to make like everything look exactly exactly the same? What if what if they had had you know embraced people's differences? What if there there was a a limit on um, uh, you know, if, I, I don't want to get into the debate of free speech, which is exactly what's happening on university campuses. And actually, that's what Daryl Horn's article is talking about mostly is about about the ways in which we're pretending free speech is is like the way is is um, um, free speech is the reason why people are allowed to use anti-Semitic slurs. Right. That's the current trope of today, which is what she's saying. And and sort of the point that we're making that there's always going to be a trope that's against the Jews. But what if we just allowed Jews to to um, be who they were or other other groups of people to be who they were and to embrace differences and then respect it and tolerate it and allow us to 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 with respect um, be who we are. And I think that's what Rabbi Sachs says um, in this this last piece on source number 15. I'll just read it for you. And that is how we must fight anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never ends with Jews. And the reason is be because anti-Semitism is hatred of difference. But difference is what makes us human, precisely because every one of us is different. Every other one of us, um, precisely because every one of us is different from every other one of us, each of us is unique therefore irreplaceable, and therefore sacred. There's real kudusha in embracing difference and embracing the fact that that we we are put onto the earth to do and represent different different things. Um, and I I I want to believe that that um, that is the the message ultimately of fighting um, this war is not disappearing, is not leaving campus, is not, um, is not, you know, disappearing into like, you know, going to a different country or going to a safer place. Um, and it's certainly not what's happening in Israel, right? Like going back to to the notion of, of um, one, one thing that I've noticed by bearing witness is that, is that although the, the country is fraught and there's so many like distinguishing and different ways that people are confronting war and um with such um desire and feel lot and prayer that the hostages are, are returned and and you know everything is politicized but ultimately people are are leaning in not out right they're 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 remaining to fight the, whatever the fight is to fight the fight of of moving to a a better place and a time of of hope and a time where where you know we will be able to to live um in a little bit more of harmony um so you know i think that this this metaphor of of doors is a, a door is both a boundary is both something that that um, allows us to to close up our own spaces and uh, to be who we are um, freely, um, but also to allow um, th those doors, you know, to have some ex outward facing external expression to the rest of the world of who we are, and then it's really up to the individuals to to, you know, treat those doors as sacred, treat those boundaries as as sacred and um and also treat those doors as symbolic ways of creating healthy boundaries and embracing differences um not only to as a way to protect us right doors are something that we should close um and 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 sometimes even lock as a protective stance but also as a signal to create distinct spaces from our neighbors that that reflect who we are but also um offer up um, a sense of, of of tolerance and respect for the way that other people might be might be different, um, and so 
as Purim rolls around and as we read the story, this sort of well-known story, uh, I think I bring a a whatever is going in the world lens um, to to reading the Megillah each year. I know that for me this year, um, I I want to be be focused on um, the ways in which. We can both embrace difference and allow our differences to to flourish, um, to be who we are, and to um, to not bow down, so to speak, to the current culture, um, and with with deep respect, sort of stand up straight and and be who we are. So I'll pause there, and um, I don't know if there's any comments or questions, but. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Horitz. Uh, that was incredible. We actually had the honor of having uh, Dara Horn here in Arizona yesterday, and we were able to to sit down and, and, and learn with her. I'm going to open it up, friends. I know some of you were messaging me. Um, now is the time to ask questions and share comments. Um, you can either do that by unmuting yourself, sending us a direct message for those of you who are in the live and or um, sending a chat here on the on the Zoom itself. Go ahead and and ask your questions, friends. Okay, I see a question in the chat. I'm just taking it in. We're talking about witnessing hatred specifically, but hatred of difference. Is there a way for us as Jews to bear witness to both the suffering of Israeli Jews and the Jews worldwide, as well as the suffering innocent Palestinian civilians in Gaza who are so who are also viewed as different? Yeah, I mean, I think that that as humans um, and as Jews, we uh, we need to open our eyes as widely as possible. Um, and I think that this notion of of inherent hate, um, we have to sort of pause and ask ourselves, where do we suffer and struggle from inherent hatred? Um, what are the ways in which we haven't been our best selves because of of falling into the tropes um, that we have have imbibed over the years for others? Um, and as as you know, as victims or as people have who, who hate has been directed to, we should learn from that and and know the limits of of not sort of blindly um, passing on that irrational hate onto another group of people. At the same time, I you know, with full recognition, I I'm not in charge of of um, I mean, I think if I was, I <laughs> maybe maybe things would be different. I'm just joking. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, it's hard to judge and to sit in judgment, um, even as we do judge, um, for the reasons and and the 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 ways in which you know the Israeli society and government are choosing to 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 fight this war. I think that we can inherently disagree and struggle and um, and you know shout against it, and at the same time. I think we have to really check our own um, biases and um, and at the same time think about how we are protecting our, our future so that we can live a, a really flourishing full life of of being you know the Jews that we need to be. Thank you, um, thank you so much, Rob, uh, Rabbi Sarah. I have a question for you. Um, Something that I've noticed is uh, anti-Semitism that spews from religious organizations, like whether it's far right Christian nationalists or a lot of um, extremist Muslims, is that they view Jews as uh, mythological creatures from their stories, from their own faith base, as we know a lot of them have um, really stemmed off of Judaism. So therefore, it's easier for them to say, this is not a real people, but a people of stories within our our fandom, if if you must say, or, or these like mythological uh, people, where in reality, there's, there's millions of us here now alive. How do we transition this ideology of of seeing people as a sort of a mythological creatures within religious ideology that we see a lot of of anti-Semitism stemming from when we have uh, interfaith conversations? Wow, um, that's a really interesting 
framing of some of the uh, uh, tropes that we've been talking about. Um, look, I think that that the reason why I wanted to build this argument both from from uh, beginning to talk about irrationality um, and then to inherit hate is because I think both are true. And I think that the the question again that we have to consider is if there is just irrational dialogue, um, it's very hard to get to a place of of uh, reconciliation or or meeting of the minds and hearts and souls. And in that situation, which it feels like we're in now, what do we do? And so for me, I think it just goes back to my basic, like very oversimplistic pre premise, which is just like be who we are even more. I would say I would say it differently. Facts on the ground, right? Facts on the ground are Jews, you know, are good con 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 contributing people to society and humanity, and we're not. You know, there might be bad eggs in every society, and but as a, a group, there is, you know, deep, um, deep ability to give and to do and to be givers of society. So I, I guess I would just undermine um, some of those tropes, I'm calling them, based on on embracing even more fully who we are and putting facts on the ground of, of modeling um, what Judaism means today. Thank you so much. Others, if you have questions, please feel free to share. Again, either on the Facebook live stream, you're able to comment or on the chat here itself. Uh, we have one question here from Facebook. Um, thank you so much for this. It has been great. Do you feel like the current rise of anti-Semitism is somehow uniting the Jewish community, both in the United States and in Israel? Um, I think that I felt a tremendous amount of unity in the first month or so of after October 7th. I felt that unity both um, within the diaspora and um, and between the the diaspora and Israel and within Israel. I think that as we move further and further away from October seventh, I'm seeing I'm seeing a greater disparity and split, um, both amongst you know Jewish community like within Jewish communities and. Um, and between America and and Israel and within Israel itself, right? I think I, in my three times that I've went, the conversation is always around one thing, but there has been an evolution of the conversations. Uh, uh, people, I think, are more willing to disagree or to um, voice different opinions. Um, and I'll just say that I'm I'm wor I'm worried about it. I think that that I, depending on where I am and which community I'm in. Um, where I'm finding myself, there is on one hand like-minded people gravitating towards one another to seek solace and comfort. So within an echo chamber, I would say there is a complete, uh, there is much more of a, a marrying of minds, so to speak. But then once you step out of those echo chambers, I think that the split between communities is even more apparent. Well, friends, thank you so much. Uh, we are at our time. We deeply appreciate your uh, just phenomenal Torah that you always bring. Thank you so much, Rabbi Horowitz. Thank you all of you for staying here and watching, all of you who are connecting, who will be watching the recording as well. Keep learning with us and let's keep fighting anti-Semitism and living and, and making sure that we... Um, as, as a community, just keep contributing, as, as Rabbi Horowitz said. We are givers of society, and we're going to keep giving such um, powerful um, Torah and be able to contribute and help those in need. Thank you so much for all of you who joined today. Take care.